Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for choosing to spend a little time with us viewing our Sunday morning worship experience. And I pray that you will receive something that will help you on your journey. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to learn to welcome adversities, trials, and tribulations without complaining or grumbling so that we can be your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, our topic for today is uh, a preacher's paradise, a preacher's paradise. And our text is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 9. And I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. It reads, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told or uttered, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. And even though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would speak uh, things that are true, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me or buffet me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I sought the Lord, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, that he would remove it from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. And therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of God may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecution and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, so our subject again is a preacher, a preacher's paradise, a preacher's paradise. Now to kind of set the stage, I, I, I'll, I'll kind of give use this as an introduction uh, by way of a question to start with. Have you ever had a top secret? I'm talking about something that was really secret and your friend or loved one said, you cannot tell this under no circumstance. I'm telling you and you only, you cannot tell anybody. It required that you be, be sworn to secrecy that you would never tell anyone under no circumstances. Can you imagine winning millions of dollars in the lottery and not being able to tell your closest family members or friends? The Apostle Paul was in a similar situation, but to a greater extent. Every preacher would love to have received revelations from God that no other preacher knew. Preachers are given great revelations and visions, but the truth that's uh, revealed in the book of Ecclesiastes uh, places a great limitation on what we have that we can reveal. Le Le Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 uh, reads, The things that have been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. 
And there is no new thing under the sun. So anything preachers nowadays have that, that God has given them to reveal, it's already been given to some other preachers and will be given to preachers afterwards. It's easy to recognize a pseudo-Christian or one that is in training, for too often we make uh, like we are strong, upstanding Christians by giving the appearance of being strong and unwavering, never making a mistake, for instance, or never uh, being caught off guard. We are good at looking like the definition of a Christian that uh, we devise, that we come up with. If we, if, if we were truly what we act like, it would be obvious to everybody that we wouldn't need Jesus. We put our appearances of never being weak, having it all together, that's what we, that's the appearance that we put on. And I thank God for a day when my oldest son was about seven years old and he had a dental appointment that I took him to early that morning. We arrived about 20 minutes before they opened and we sat on the steps by the entrance and my son presented me with a dilemma that I had to be honest with him about. I told him that that day was the worst day in my life to have to help him with his life. Until that day now, I had presented myself as a dad that had it all together, had all of the answers. He probably thought that I was someone in disguise as his dad, but really was uh, similar to, you're, you're, there's, there's a move, a TV show you, that used to come on years and years ago when I was a kid, and the narrator, narrator would always start out by saying, faster than a speeding bullet more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky is a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. This line was spoken during the introduction of an adventure of Superman between the years of 1952 and 1958. But that morning, I had to admit my weaknesses to my son and I didn't have all of the answers. Too often we work at looking like we have it all together when we really don't. The Apostle Paul teaches us that uh, our pay grade is not high enough to tell everything that God uh, gives to us. And most of us, if not all of us, will never receive the great revelation uh, that Paul received in, when he was caught up into paradise. God doesn't have to answer us when, and he doesn't have to answer us how we expect him to. We must be prepared whenever we take our problems to God to accept no or not yet, or live with your problem because my grace is sufficient to keep you in that situation or carry you through what I've brought you to. That's so often God uh, answers our questions in that way. And we have to be ready to accept it. We must have, if not faith, as the three Hebrew boys, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, had when they faced being thrown in a fiery furnace that had been heated seven times hotter because they would not bow down and worship a false god. They didn't, they, 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 they had it, if not faith, because they didn't know if God would deliver them or not, but they did know that their God was able to deliver them. And, and, and we have to have, if not faith, that whatever we're going through, our God is able to deliver us. Whether he delivers us or not, we don't know but we do know that he's able. Now, perhaps uh, these uh, three Hebrews knew that they should uh, uh, trust God, that he was well up to their problem. And we ought to know that God is well able to keep us in our situations if he, doesn't, if he chooses not to deliver us. 
Psalms 46 and 1 said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalms 27 verse 1 through 5 says, and this is a Psalm of David, verse 27 says, and the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came up against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, this will I be confident in. One thing I have desired of the Lord that that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord, his glory, and to inquire in his temple. Verse five says, for in the time of trouble, whoo, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. And this section uh, of, of 2 Corinthians is the climax of Paul's defense of his apostleship and his love for the believers at Corinth. He was, he was hesitant to write about these personal experiences, but there was no other way to solve the problem. In fact, to avoid exalting himself, Paul describes his experience in the third person rather than in the first person. He shared with his readers three experiences from God. God had glory, had, had uh, God's glory, and shows that in these verses that God had honored him. And, and we see this in in the Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse one through six. Now the Judaizers were anxious to receive honor, and they boasted about their letters of recommendation in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. But Paul didn't look for honor from men. He looked for honor from God, and God honors him. For that alone is the honor that really counts, honor that we receive from God. Even when God allows us to suffer and go through some things, to be misused and abused, God Will, 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 will allow us to go through it so that we can honor him. Sometimes even death can be a situation where God can be glorified or receive honor and give us honor. Paul saw the glorified Christ on the very day that he was converted in Acts uh, chapter 9 verse 3 and also in chapter 22 verse 6. He saw a vision of Ananias coming to minister to him in Acts chapter 9, verse 12. And he also saw a vision from God when he was called to minister to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 22, verse 17. Now, I'm not reading those verses off uh, for you to just let them go by. It would behoove you to check them out. Go through them in your Bible and learn and, and, and make sure that I'm telling you what the Bible says. Uh, and I don't have time to read all of them uh, during this sermon. During Paul's ministry, he had visions of God to guide him and to encourage him. It was by visions that he was called to Macedonia in chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 9. When the ministry was difficult in Corinth, God encouraged Paul by a vision in Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. And after his arrest in Jerusalem, Paul was again encouraged by a vision from God in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. The angel appeared to him in the midst of the storm and assured him that uh, he and the passengers would be saved in Acts chapter 27, verse 23. Along with these special visions that related to his call and ministry, Spiritual revelations of divine truth were also communicated with Paul. And you can see some of them in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. God gave him a profound understanding of the plan of God 
for this present generation and age. Now, certainly Paul understood the mysteries of God, but God also honored Paul by talking, by, by taking him to heaven and then sending him back to earth again. This amazing experience had taken Paul 14 years, had taken place 14 years before uh, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians church. Uh, this would have uh, been uh, probably somewhere along about uh, AD 43. And this was a period in Paul's life between his departure from Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, verse 30, and his visit from Barnabas in Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Now, Jewish rabbis were accustomed to speaking about themselves in the third person. And Paul adopted that approach as he unfolds this experience to his friends and his enemies at Corinth. So wonderful was this experience that Paul was not quite sure whether God had taken him bodily into heaven or whether his spirit had left the body. There's, there's a, a quite a contrast between Paul being let down in a basket to escape and being caught up to the third heaven. Uh, Paul acknowledges here the ability of heaven and the ability of God to take people there. And that's important for us because our uh, hope is one day that we will be caught up and to be with God. And that's one of the greatest messages that any of us can share with unbelievers and believers to encourage them. The third heaven is the same as paradise, the heaven of heaven, where God dwells in glory. Thanks to modern science, mankind today have visited the heaven of the clouds. We fly above the clouds in airplanes and the heaven of the planet. Men have walked even on the moon, but man cannot get to God's heaven without God's help. Glory, hallelujah. We need God's help to get there. And Paul gives us uh, the example that God can get us there. He's well able. The interesting thing is that Paul kept quiet about this experience for 14 years. Can you have... Uh, can you imagine having such an experience that God had given you and you keep silent for four, 14 years? During those years, he was buffeted by uh, this thorn in the flesh. And perhaps people wonder why he had such a burdensome affliction. The Judaizers would have adopted the view of Job's comforters and friends and said, this affliction is a punishment brought upon you from God because of something you've done wrong. But actually, this affliction, this thorn in the side that was buffeting Paul was a gift that came from God. Some of Paul's friends, good friends even, may have tried to encourage him by saying, cheer up, Paul. One day you'll be in heaven. And Paul could have replied to him, that's why I have this thorn. I went to heaven. God honored Paul by granting him visions and revelations and by taking him to heaven. But he honored him through, uh, he honored him further by permitting him to hear unspeakable words while he was there in the heaven. He overheard the divine secrets that are shared only in heaven. And these things could uh, be spoken by God and, and by being in heaven, we could, he, they, they, Paul was able to hear them. But they could not be spoken by men to men. And so Paul uh, could not utter them for 14, for 14 years. God prohibited him from uttering him. And I think this is, this is just me, but I believe the part of the reason for the thorn in the side was so that uh, uh, God's way of assisting 
Paul's uh, believers that he was talking to and enemies <laughs> that it wasn't true. So nobody would believe him anyway. Uh, even Moses was uh, intimate with God. He met God on the mountaintop, but Paul met the Lord in paradise. Paul had exercised great spiritual discipline during those 14 years for he had told uh, no one of his experience. And there's no doubt that this vision of God's glory was one of the sustaining powers in Paul's life and his ministry. No matter where he was in prison, in the deep or in dangerous travels, he knew that God was with him and that all would be well. You and I are not going to heaven till we die or till uh, Jesus returns. But we have a great encouragement in the fact that we are one day. And today we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, as stated in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. And then Ephesians chapter 2 verse 21 and 22 reminds us that we have a position of authority and victory above all. While we have not seen God's glory as Paul did, we do share God's glory now. Uh, and, and one day we shall enter into heaven and behold the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, we, we, we share in God's glory and, and, and you'd probably need a verse to back that up. So John chapter 17, verse 22 reminds us that uh, we do share in God's glory. And then uh, chapter 17 of John uh, verse 24 reminds us and encourages us that one day we shall enter into heaven and behold, be able to see the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, such an honor as this would have made most people very proud and lifted up and exalted in their own eyes. But instead of keeping quiet for 14 years, they would have immediately told the world and for the purpose of becoming famous. But Paul did not become proud. He simply told the truth. It was not empty boasting and, 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 and let the facts speak for themselves. That's what Paul did. And we would do so much better our government officials and, and all of us, our church leaders, all of us as followers of Jesus Christ uh, would do so well if we would learn to let the facts speak for themselves, to let God speak for himself, the truth speak for itself. Now, Paul's great concern was that nobody would rob God of the glory and give it to Paul. He wanted others to have an honest estimate of him and his works. How Paul? How could Paul uh, have such a great experience and still remain humble? Here's the answer. Because he was following Jesus and following Jesus takes cross-bearing and beyond cross-bearing. At whatever stage of following Jesus we are in, always remember that one Friday on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, Jesus hung, bled, and he died for in our place. But that's not the end of the story. Early the third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. So that's it for a preacher's paradise. And hopefully you have a better view of, of that mystery that uh, we've heard preached about. Not that I have something new, but just a different way of looking at it. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for first preparing us for what lies ahead. We pray that you would keep us assured that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. 
and you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Don't forget, mask up, practice social distancing, and wash your hands often. Wear your mask whenever appropriate. If somebody's coming to your house that don't have a mask on, you have a right to turn them around at the door. Most people have a mask, they just choose not to put it on. So you choose that if they're going to be around you, they will wear a mask. Now, I'm not talking about people that you live with. Yeah. Uh, uh, this too, this COVID-19 season that we're going through will pass. So as uh, one of my associate ministers always say, stand strong and allow God to be your strength. So long.